the studies you hear and 90% of the talks you hear should be properly entitled the bacteriome rather than the microbiome because that's essentially what people are, are talking about. Uh, in the APC, we also look at the mycobiome, the phageome, the immunome, the helminthome, all the other ohms that really make up a, a complete microbiome. And if you wonder, you know, could something as trivial as a single probiotic or a probiotic together with a prebiotic genuinely have an effect on human health? Well, there was this paper in Nature uh, just a, a couple of weeks ago which showed that when they gave uh, these kids um, Lactobacillus plantarum and FOS, and there were thousands, I think there were over 7,000 involved in this uh, study, they were able to reduce bacterial sepsis from all causes with an odds ratio of 0.6, of 60%. So they were able to reduce the total num amount of sepsis in these children by 40%. A million children die of sepsis every year. So they make the point at the end, a large proportion of neonatal sepsis in developing countries could be effectively prevented using a symbiotic, a probiotic with a prebiotic. So if you really wonder, you know, is this probiotic thing, is it a bit of a uh, smoke and mirrors? This is real. You can genuinely prevent these infections in, uh, at least under these conditions. We've used model systems, obviously, because thankfully in Ireland and in most developed countries, we don't have a high enough incidence of infectious disease to do prospective studies. We need to uh, demonstrate effectiveness of anti-infective therapies in animals. But what we've tried to choose in most cases are domestic animals, our production animals, where the translation is actually achieved once you show a benefit in the animal itself. And then you can infer things from the human population, but the disease itself is the animal disease. So one of the challenges we set ourselves with probiotics, could probiotics have a role in porcine salmonellosis? That is a disease where, um, unfortunately in Ireland, uh, a lot of the pigs in Ireland, in particular herds in, uh, in particular, uh, suffer from salmonellosis. And we have things called category three herds, where most of the pigs in the herd uh, suffer salmonellosis during their relatively short lives. And so we can uh, go into those herds and see, can an intervention have an effect? It's also, so it's an animal welfare issue. Obviously, it's a model for human salmonellosis. Pigs are very large monogastrics. They can eat uh, virtually the same type of food that we eat and therefore they're, they're better models than mice or rats for an infection like this. Obviously, there are food safety implications. If we could reduce the salmonella carriage in the pigs, we could reduce food safety implications in humans. And there are the economic costs of salmonellosis in pig production and then in human health. And salmonella is probably the, or is the most common cause of pig diarrhea. So what we did was we went into a, a category three herd. So this is a, a herd that was very badly infected with salmonella, but in among that herd, we could find some pigs, some individual pigs, who were not shedding salmonella. They'd seroconverted, but they were not shedding salmonella. But they're genetically identical, living in the same environment, same diet, so we speculated it might be something to do with their microbiome. We isolated over 10,000 strains from these seroconverted salmonella-free pigs. We characterized those strains in the lab, so we spent a lot of time in the lab doing all the kinds of tests you might imagine to see if these bacteria were anti-salmonella, whether they could prevent salmonella binding to tissue cells, salmonella invasion. And in the end, we came up with five strains that we thought were the lead candidates to test in a pig model. There were about five of us involved in the study. We couldn't agree which strain we all thought was best. So we decided, let's put all five strains into the pigs. If, all, if one of the five works, then the five together should work. Um, if five together are better than one, then we'll still get a good result. So we went with this thing we call the five live consortium, uh, live, five live strains that we administered to the pigs, four lactobacilli and a pedococcus pentisaceus. We found out just as we finished the experiment that one of the bacteria, the lactobacillus salivarius here, produces a bacteriocin that kills the other four. That was kind of unfortunate. But we did this uh, animal trial anyway with a deliberate infection and it took a lot of effort from our animal authority to get the ethical permission to deliberately give pigs salmonella because it makes them extremely ill and we had to have a lot of uh, ethical oversight and veterinary oversight to do this experiment but we, we did manage to get it done and it was these uh, crossbred pigs. We had to train them to drink milk. Pigs don't like milk. It's very hard to get them to drink milk but once you train them to do it, they'll do it and then we administered the probiotic mix in milk. We grew the probiotics 
independently, each of the five independently. We spun out the cells, we mixed them with milk, so it wasn't a fermented milk, it was just milk carrying the uh, probiotic strains. They got about four by 10 to the 10 per day for 30 days, and on day six, seven, and eight, they were challenged with one by 10 to the eight Salmonella typhimurium uh, PT12, which we'd shown previously infects these uh, pigs. And we did it in another site, it was double-blinded, uh, we weren't involved in the trial, and there was, as I said, veterinary oversight for that. And here's the results in the control pigs. So in the control pigs, 80% got diarrhea within about three days and, and had that again at four days, and then it started to diminish. Uh, the pigs were shedding uh, very high numbers of salmonella in their feces uh, over the, the time period. This is in days. Uh, the control pigs had very high uh, combined clinical scores. They were scored again in a double-blinded way by vets. And they put on... Uh, whatever that is, about 10 kilos of weight in the 28 days of the experiment. These are pigs which are weaned, just weaned, and they're, and they're putting on weight at a pretty strong rate. And here are the probiotic fed mice, or uh, rat, uh, pigs in this case. By day three, only 20% uh, of the pigs, or two of the 10, uh, had uh, diarrhea, significantly reduced shedding, four to five logs fewer salmonella being shed in the feces of these animals, much lower combined clinical scores, and much higher weight gain. So once again, a simple intervention, just probiotic live bacteria, having a very significant effect on the health outcomes in these animals. And if I just bring that down to diarrhea on day four, clinical scores uh, overall, salmonella shedding on day 15, and weight gain on day 15, you can see very significant differences. These are not you know, I haven't put the error bars in this because the error bars are just absolutely tiny. These are very significant outcomes. Interestingly enough, when we looked to see, well, which of the five bacteria were having the effect, we saw that the fecal microbiota, one of the, mic one of the bacteria, this Lactobacillus murinus, absolutely dominated in the feces over the other uh, four. And we thought, that's, if, you know, if I had to make my bet now, I'd bet on that one being the one that's having the effect. But what you can do with pigs, which you can't do with humans, is you can sacrifice them and then look right up through the GI tract. And when you look in the ileum, where the salmonella infection is actually occurring, it was another one of the bacteria. In fact, it was the one producing the bacteriocin that was out-competing all its neighbors up there. In fact, in one pig, it was 100% the murinus in its feces and 100% the bacteriocin producer in the, in the ileum. So now if I had to bet, I'd bet on this guy. So it's just a little warning about using fecal... Uh, readings as a measure for what's happening 20 feet away uh, up in the, the higher reaches of the gut. Probiotics and bovine mastitis was another one we, we got involved in. This is a very interesting study. We, bovine mastitis, I'm sure everyone's aware of, uh, probably the single most uh, economically costly disease in, in animal health, normally treated with broad-spectrum antibiotics, which can be successful, but then the milk has to be withheld for a period of time, and that's an economic cost for the farmer. We're trying to get antibiotics out of uh, animal husbandry, of course. So this is what the, the milk from an animal with mastitis looks like. Uh, it's obviously no longer looks like milk at all. We, again, had a lot of trouble with ethical permission to do a probiotic trial. We wanted to administer probiotics not orally, but directly to the infected teeth. Um, eventually, we were allowed to do this with 11 animals who were on their way to be culled. They had uh, very uh, rampant mastitis. They were not responding to antibiotic treatment, and so they were being sent to be uh, culled. And we got them diverted to our center for three days where we could uh, treat them. And all 11 animals, a single application of a bacterium producing a bacteriocin to the T canal resulted in the milk being completely restored. And in fact, all 11, all 11 animals went back to their uh, farms. None of them went on to be culled in the end. And to this day, we still get phone calls from farmers saying, remember that thing you gave our guy uh, a few months ago? Uh, but unfortunately, we, don't, we haven't it developed yet as a, a treatment. Uh, we looked, we did, did a second trial. This time, we, we looked at a higher number of animals, 50 animals in this case but they were split, 25 received the gold standard antibiotic treatment, 25 received the Slactococcus lactis as a probiotic, and the cure rates and the uh, subclinical rates, these are the animals that were 
uh, cured but still carried the infectious pathogen in the uh, mast in the in the gland, uh, there was no significant difference. So the probiotic was matched with the gold standard antibiotic treatment. Uh, we've just repeated this trial this year and with the same results, and now we're working on formulation of how we can formulate these uh, Lactococcus lactis so that they can have a, a longer shelf life. This is not a disease of any economic importance, but it's uh, murine listeriosis. What it is is a disease where we can control a lot of the different parameters. We can control the animals. Listeria is very genetically tractable, and we can use probiotics in this environment. Uh, this was a very dramatic experiment. We gave groups of mice, each represented here, uh, a lux-tagged listeria, so a listeria which emits light, so you can follow it in real time in the animals. And we gave them different probiotics, and as you can see, two or five of the six antibiotics we tested had no effect. These animals all became infected. This is the liver, the gallbladder, the spleen you can see being infected, and all these animals uh, would have died within another day of this experiment, but one animal was completely protected by the probiotics. So probiotics are strain-specific. Not all probiotics work in every situation. So what was it about this particular probiotic and what we found was that this probiotic produces a bactericin, so this is the probiotic, this is the listeria in a lawn. It's the only one of the six strains that produces an anti-listerial bactericin, which gave us an obvious hint as to mechanism. So what we did was the obvious. We made a genetic knockout in that lactobacillus. We knocked out just one single gene that prevents it from producing the bactericin. In all other respects, that strain is the exact same. And when we do that, we find that the bacterium-producing strain completely protects the mice. The knock knockout has no protective effect at all. So a probiotic effect with a life-or-death outcome reduced to a single gene, uh, which I think is the ultimate demonstration of a probiotic effect and a probiotic gene. And in fact, if we did the opposite, if we gave the listeria the ability to overcome the bacterium by cloning the immunity gene to that bacteria into the listeria, now the listeria can kill the mice whether the probiotic is there or not. So it works in both directions. We became very interested in bactericins. We already were. And what we did was we looked at the entire lactobacillus pangenome for the spread of uh, bactericins. So uh, over 230 representatives of each lactobacillus uh, species were sequenced. And then we could screen for bactericins. And you see they're quite widespread. These are the, are the lactobacilli you find mainly in the gut, and they seem to be particularly prevalent in bacteria in production. Some other clades which are involved found in plants and other environments are not so bacteria and rich. Uh, Lactobacillus salivaris is actually down here, and it does produce bacteria, as obviously have we shown. And what we also did then was we, we looked for kind of genes which have gone dead, if you like. Bacteria need a big cluster of genes to make them. And what we found was lots of instances where the bacteriocin operons were degraded. They no longer had the ability to produce their bacteriocin. Uh, for those of you who are Game of Thrones fans, it's like these white walkers that were dead, but they were still looked as if they could be functional. And so what we did, we, so here's an example of their kind of sequences. Some were missing leaders. Some were missing the production machinery. Some couldn't be exported. What we were able to do was take all these genes and essentially re reincarnate them. We put them back into an E. coli strain where we provided all the machinery to produce the bactericin, and sure enough, they can all produce uh, bactericin. So the bactericins are, are in there, they're intact, they're just a kind of a reservoir of bactericins across these organisms. I think I'll go through this really quickly. We're also interested in Clostridium difficile associated diarrhea. Nobody likes doing fecal microbiota transplants. What we'd like to have is a bactericin that would, use, that would work as well. What we want is a bactericin that's a very narrow spectrum. We found a bacterium that kills Clostridium difficile very effectively, but doesn't seem to affect any of the other members of the microbiota. Uh, I won't go into its structure because it's, uh, it would take too long. What I can show here is that if you do an artificial fecal fermentation, Clostridium difficile is inoculated at 10 to the 6. It rises to about 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8, over 24 hours. Vancomycin, metronidazole, broad-spectrum bacteriocins are all good at reducing the C. diff. This narrow spectrum one is equally good at reducing C. diff, but it has absolutely no impact on the microbiota, whereas the others cause significant damage to the microbiota. So we can maybe mine for these very narrow spectrum bacteria as well. 
There are also bactericins present in uh, some of these foods like uh, nicin. Nicin is a food ingredient that many companies and some of the companies here I know make. Uh, it's got one big problem from, from our point of view. It doesn't kill listeria. So there's listeria growing in the absence of nicin, in the presence of nicin. It doesn't really make much of a difference. What we've been able to do is we've done some engineering. Just making a single amino acid change, changing that methionine to a valine, now gives you a nicin that's completely active against uh, listeria. Here's a listeria in hot dogs using the same lux tagging. They grow very well. Uh, here they are in the presence of nicin. They grow very well. But in the presence of nice V, they're, they're unable to grow at all. We've done lots of this kind of bi bioengineering. Here's the hinge region. We can bioengineer this hinge region and get lots of variants which are better against uh, different targets. We can multiply these. So here's a wild type. K12A, that change there, makes it better. K22T makes it better. Put the two together, you get even better again. And now it's getting so good that it's actually starting to kill the producer strain because its own immune system can't keep up with these evolutionary changes. There's also nicin resistance. A lot of bacteria out there have nicin resistance genes. That was characterized by uh, Barry Froseth and Larry McKay 30 years ago. We've engineered a version of nicin now which completely overcomes this nicin resistance. So we don't have to worry about nicin resistance strains anymore. And just recently, we've made a gastric protease-resistant nicin. We had to alter five amino acids throughout the uh, molecule. We retained full activity, but now it's no longer digested by gastric proteases. So we can now begin to think about applying nicin in the gut as a way of manipulating the microbiota. And very quickly, in the last minute available, phage. We're very interested in phage. Of course, in America, you use phage in food safety already for listeria and salmonella protection. And in Georgia, they use them uh, for human medicine. We're very interested in them as well. They're the most ubiquitous biological entities on Earth. We've isolated phage against lots of different uh, bacteria, lots of pathogens, and commensal organisms, which, which aren't listed here, but including Listeria, Campylobacter, Salmonella, E. coli, Staph, some of the main foodborne pathogens. Just to give you an example of this working in a mouse model, again using the Lux tag trick, these mice are infected with Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Their lungs have become severely infected. We give them a mix of two phages. We just apply a drop of the phage on the nose, and within eight hours, the infections are almost completely eliminated. Because the, the bacteria, of course, the bacteriophage will self-replicate and take care of whatever number of Pseudomonas are present. And even the Pseudomonas that have begun to uh, get down into the gut have been uh, completely eliminated by the time the experiment comes to a finish. We've also isolated bacteriophage against E. coli 0157, a, a very important bacteria in food safety, of course. And we can even show that fully formed biofilms, uh, so that the biofilms of these E. coli are fully formed, can be absolutely a, a eliminated by adding phage. So biofilms are not restricted to planktonic cells. They can also kill cells in, um, in these, these very advanced biofilms. So what I hope I've convinced you is I've taken away the kind of the modulators could be or might be. I think it is a significant player in deciding the outcome of an infectious event. We can intervene in our mine interventions from this niche. And these particular ones I gave you examples of. That I didn't give you an example of, but we all know about it. And I think it's something that we should exploit far more in food uh, microbiology and food production and in uh, medicine is taking advantage of these uh, really very, very effective life or death outcome effective uh, treatments and preventive uh, therapies for infectious disease. A lot of people I should thank, but uh, particularly the institute at which I work and Paul, who's my colleague in all this work, and these are the people whose work I used uh, particularly for this talk and the funding agencies and you, of course, for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I was really interested in your talk. I'm a large animal veterinarian, so I was very interested in the talk about bovine mastitis. I was really interested in what potential culture you had on those cows in terms of what they were growing um, prior to the treatment with the bactericine. We took all comers. And so we did look, and some were staph, infected with staph, some E. coli, um, some Klebsiella, and some we could never find the etiological cause. We couldn't find the microbial cause. 
So we just we took them as having mastitis. We didn't screen for the cause of it, and we treated them as all comers. Thank you, uh, Mark Allard, US FDA. Have you done any experiments uh, using some of these techniques to like clean up equipment or in, you know, inanimate objects along the farm to fork continuum? We have, uh, in, not, not to a great degree, but we have done it with, what we're very interested in is, is combination therapies. So any of these will work, but pretty quickly things begin to come, become resistant or tolerant. What we're doing is we're combining phage, bactericins, and things like essential oils, and using those to clean equipment, and it's, it really is, can, can be pretty spectacular, particularly on biofilms. Any other questions for Dr. Hill?